There we go. Right. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to um, the next in our series of interviews with uh, New York School um, affiliated, adjacent, connected scholars, um, poets, enthusiasts, and so on. Um, we're joined today by Stephanie Anderson um, and Kristen Tapson. Um, the main reason for which is that they have a brilliant new book coming out um, called All This Thinking, The Correspondence of Bernadette Mayer and Clark Coolidge. Um, and this is coming out with the University of New Mexico Press at the end of the month. Um, so this is a, a book that looks at the relationship between Mayer and Coolidge um, and focuses on a really kind of intense three year period um, in what was really three decades of correspondence between them. Um, and it's a book that kind of um, obviously thinks about them in the context of that relationship, but also in the context of the kind of poetic movements, um, the radical poetics that followed, um, you know, the, the kind of post in the post-war decades and, and, and helps us perhaps think through some of the artistic practices of Mayer and, and Coolidge themselves. Um, they were originally, Stephanie and Kristen were originally planning to come to Paris um, back in 2020, I think, to talk talk us um, through this this book which was obviously um, in a much earlier stage at that point and um, to think through the letters and um, to think through questions of um, things like gossip and writing and and this kind of shared sense of aesthetic rapport that Bernadette Mayer and, and Clark Coolidge had that kind of set them up apart from their contemporaries um, and and then in the end um, Kristen came to Paris in in May and in, in April whenever it was and talked through um, some of the project aspects of the project, but obviously lots of network members couldn't be there. So um, we get a chance today to ask some questions and hear a little bit about um, the book. So thank you both very much um, for taking the time um, to be here. I wanted to just start with a question about what led you to put the book together and also how you came to be doing it together. Um, because I think, and, and you've kind of talked a little bit about this in the past, but it's really striking that this book of correspondence between two friends should have been put together um, by two friends who live in very different parts of the world, um, and presumably it, it involved an awful lot of correspondence. Um, so there's a really nice synergy <laughs> to that in the in the way that lots of New York scholarship often kind of mirrors aspects of um, the poetry, particularly with regards friendship and collaboration. So what's the kind of story behind this book? How did it come to be? I, I sort of want to take this one because <laughs> I love this story. Um, sure, go ahead. I'm so glad that you asked this first, actually, because um, so Stephanie and I met at a conference uh, and, and Stephanie, just interrupt me if if I get details wrong, but um, a conference in Arno in I want to say 2012 or something like that. It was in, and we both yeah. gave or yeah, we both gave papers on um, on Clark Coolidge's The Crystal Text. And so it was just this like sort of meet cute <laughs> where we mm -hmm. heard each other's talks and then you know became friendly and and kept in touch. And I remember, you know, just wanting to, you know, work with someone who was thinking about the same things as me. And, and so I I reached out to Stephanie. Um, when there was an opportunity to do uh, a conference at the University of Chicago where she was a graduate student, I was a graduate student at NYU. And I think this was, well, I'm not sure the dates, but maybe 2015, something like that, um, 2014, 2015, uh, that I, I took this trip and, and Stephanie was so incredibly kind and let, you know, let me stay at, stay at her place. And we had dinners together and talked poetry. And, and at some point it just came up and he said, you know, we've both been reading these letters for our research. Is anyone doing this? Is anyone putting this, this correspondence together? Um, and, and that was sort of the, the uh, origin of, um, of the idea. And then we you know, sort of began to pursue it and figure out you know, where all the pieces of the puzzle were. Yeah, we had this, in, in my memory, we had this like sort of amazing late night, um, uh, you know, discussion over over wine, where um, we were talking about both working in the archive and all the things we had found in the archive, and and one or the other of us just said, you know, the most amazing thing, and that that I remember finding in the archive was um, Coolidge, Coolidge and Mayer's correspondence, and uh, and the other one said, oh my gosh, yeah, like why, you know, 
like this is this is clearly something that everyone should read um and so that's that was the dream or that was the the moment of the dream um but then you know then the logistics took a long time yeah, between the, that initial germ and the rest of it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I have like a more theoretical question, but I do wonder the mundane logistics. How did you begin that process with two living, then living poets? Um, yeah, and like who's who have these kind of archives of their own and these incredible, you know, verse that must have been insurmountable. <laughs> Yeah, we, I mean, the first step was to simply try to track down all the letters, and um, they were mainly at two archives at San Diego and Buffalo, um, but Coolidge's Buffalo uh, um, papers hadn't at that point been cataloged, um, and so we ended up, I think, uh, um, getting photocopies, you know, and then there was this, like, kind of horrible romantic period where we were kind of pouring over photocopies and dating things by hand and putting together spreadsheets and trying to figure out um, what the sequence of the letter was, was. And that I think lasted for a long time, right, Kristen? Yes, yes. Our Excel spreadsheets went back and forth for a really long time. Um, and, you know, I, I, I learned a lot, you know, Stephanie is a poet has you know had intuitions about the process that I didn't, and I learned a lot. Um, you know, working through that, that it, I think we, I believe we reached out to to Susan and and Clark Coolidge first, um, and you know, got permission to kind of start pursuing the project, and then it was sort of as things moved along, um, and once we had sort of a working draft, and it was sort of clear that we had all the letters in some kind of order um, that things started to, to progress, I think, from there. And how did you, um, you've, you've obviously got, a, there's a huge amount of it. How did you settle on this kind of three year window? Um, what is the window and, and how did that come about? That's a great question. Because yeah. that was, that was a, a, a labor of love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really um, tough like a really tough thing to yes kind of figure out it seems yes um we we had you know this is was the first book that I've worked on and I wasn't sure at the beginning um you know how many words is a reasonable amount for a book or something like that and so we had a lot of idealism about how big a book we could publish uh and, but I think the whole correspondence is is about 200,000 words and we had about a hundred thousand words to work with in a kind of to work with in, in one a book mm. in an academic book form um and so we were basically cutting cutting the the correspondence in half and we went through the, the mathematics of it became its own whole journey you know the, there are some letters that i think i know the word count better than i know the content of the of letters <laughs> because i was trying to figure out you know if we cut this one or if we cut that one um and and so you know there's you know, one thing that Stephanie said really beautifully at, at various points is just that, you know, if this book could have looked so many different ways with different choices and, um, and you know, there, was, there were so many contingencies that led us to, to where we, we are, but, um, but we were really struck by these really long letters in that period that became the book which was from September of 1979 to October of 1982. Uh, and this is a period that follows um, a, a few years where Clark and Bernadette were living close to each other. And so there was that that period of intense, intimate, um, you know, friendship, being together, drinking beers, hanging out, talking poetry, and then the um, the shift to living in different places. And so there there is a shift in the correspondence in those years. Um, both from you know, presumably knowing each other very well and also you know missing each other uh missing that that local friendship and um having the letters to some extent to substitute for that as the word friendship has now come up five or six times i'll ask about it um or start asking about it i know rona has some questions too um you've got your friendship rona and i have our friendship <laughs> um <laughs> And all of these New York school poets have their friendships. And um, 
the, the Coolidge Mayer one is one that people may be less familiar with. For example, you know, um, Josh Schneiderman's book of correspondence of O'Hara and Koch, okay, documented, you know, O'Hara and Ashbury always mentioned. Um, uh, the second generation, all of its confluences and, um, you know, um, all of the, the constellations of friendships that you could make out of that. But the Coolidge Mayer one is a little, little, little less known of. Could you give the uh, kind of new Coolidge reader uh, an overview of what that looked like or how it emerged? What, how that relationship developed. You know, a lot of the poets that we've, Ron and I are working on a book together of interviews and um, and many poets mentioned that the friendships and mentorships like theirs began in the poetry workshops at St. Mark's Place. Um, so what about Coolidge and Mayer? How did their friendship begin? Coolidge and, and Mayer started a little earlier. Um, they they started corresponding in, is it 67, Kristen? Um, okay when their um Coolidge had solicited some some work for his little magazine I'm going to I don't know if I've ever said this word out loud before jogglers um yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah and 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 then um and then there's a little bit of correspondence too um where I think let me check but um they read together pretty early in those years too, um, and kind of get to know each other through the early 60s. Um, and so have mutual editorial um, you know, solicitations and collaborations. Um, and then after they read together at the Poetry Project in 71, um, they, I think their friendship becomes more intense and they um, they decide to visit the cave in Eldon's cave um, in Western Massachusetts, Massachusetts together in 72. And, uh, and the friendship sort of takes off from there. So they discover a kind of um, shared set of interests that are maybe differentiate them from some of their peers. They're both very interested in, Kristen can speak more to this, um, in geology, um, in Antarctic explorers, um, in science. And, and this is a place where, where they can really have um, collaboration and discussion together about this. So, so it is, it's affiliated with the poetry project, but, um, but it, it predates reading together to some degree. Yeah. Read... Add anything? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say that's you know beautifully said. You know those the the early letters um, that Stephanie is referring to, where the the sort of early development of their friendship. Uh, they're not part of the book, but they are are you know fabulous and often very you know some of them are very long and um, and so you know in a in a if we had had the space, that was the uh, the part of the book that we would have liked to have added. We had this gap in the letters when they were both um, living near each other. And so it would have created this situation where we would have had these early letters and then a gap and then these later letters. And I think in, in the context of a of a book, it would have wouldn't um, wouldn't quite have come across the way that we would have wanted. But those early letters are are quite lovely as their as their, their friendships developing. Does that friendship kind of take shape because of that their sense of their kind of outsider-ishness um I'm just thinking of I think something Marcella Durand wrote about them in terms of um they I think what she said was that they 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 have this kind of shared in, interest in the like physical and scientific and geologic um and and like different ways of trying to encounter encounter and encompass language but like trying to cross borders like fake I think Marcella calls them fake borders that are set up between things like genres and um materials and even words like does that seem to does that kind of come through in the letters that they're kind of trying to cross borders and and embrace their outsiderishness um and and kind of push back on accepted ways of you know being but also writing yeah yeah you know I think you know, they, they have a, a real shared intensity and a shared sense of, of writing as like an endurance practice um, that fits in with other poetic movements, perhaps, but maybe less so um, with their immediate contemporaries. And, and so, um, 
yeah <laughs> sorry Stephanie do you want to add anything um <laughs> There, there's there's so many great questions. This is um, Ronnie. You really put your finger on on something that's important yeah. to us in the correspondence, uh, which is part of why we're like, ah. Yes. <laughs> uh, they really they identify that really early, like in a in a seventy. I think it's a seventy three letter. Mayor's writing quote. Somebody asked me the other day if you and I were grouped together in the same group of writers who are others in our group. Um, and Coolidge says, Coolidge responds, I didn't realize you you and I were in a group. I don't think there are any others. And they're putting all these terms in, quote. <laughs> but they 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 kind of pick up on this, and then they they really. They keep talking about it um, as the letters progress, and it's it becomes, I think, um, one of the things that drew us to the 79 to 83 period is the intensity of this feeling during that period where um, where they're both as we, we in the in the introduction, we use the phrase um, independently together. Um, mm -hmm. They're they're feeling like very. Um, very simpatico, but also separate, and that 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 separateness is part of what brings them together, but not the only thing. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's it's a very kind of poignant and beautiful aspect of of their work together. I mean, this is yeah. If I I I was kind of struggling before our conversation to put them on my map in terms of their groupings, just because it's an arduous and pointless activity to engage in with the New York school, but it's fun to say, oh, well, okay, they, they shared a house or, you know, they shared a workshop or this is, this is, a, this is where the lines fall. It's all pointless because as um, Rona quotes, it, it erase, the borders blur and erase very quickly. Um, but when I was trying to, I was thinking, no, they're, they're both outliers. That's what they share. That's their commonality. And also the fact that they both move out of New York City rather like early on in comparison with others. They don't, they don't, I mean, uh, Bernadette's from there, isn't she? She's, yeah. you know, but you know, they, they kind of move uh, on their way out quicker um, than others did. So I was like, okay, this is, this is how they fall. Um, but then looking at their style, you both have mentioned how expansive um, and exhausting or like long and exhaustive their letters are. And their poems are too. Um, their poems are demanding of a reader's like, you know, prolonged attention. That's something they share. And yet there's, there's a real stylistic difference in their um, sense of um, the lyric voice, basically, the I and the you. And I wondered if that had come up in the letters at all. I'm looking at a quotation right here that I had pulled up to prove this point. Uh, this is from Coolidge's argument over a mounting. He writes, then, I, then the I, not part of the you equation, but the spider trying to build where it is written, vibrates tentative. I don't want to talk to you about it anymore. So whereas in Mayer's work, I is everywhere. It's just like permeating the page. You are someone who can kind of like fuck off, basically, <laughs> um, and in those words, often. And I just wonder if that comes up as their their sense of audience and and lyric voice. I think I've asked seven questions at the same time. Sorry. So the first is, are, do you agree that both outliers, you know, physically, and does that influence? And then secondly, style. Does it come up? Um, do the, does the diversions is is there are there discussions over style? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, maybe one way to start it is to say that, you know, because they were living um, in different places, because, you know, Clark is is separated from sort of the New York Center, um, mm -hmm. that a lot of the letters and a lot of the pleasure of, of some of those uh, early letters is the way that Bernadette is sort of sharing the scene to him. And so they have these shared friends, but she's like on location and he's uh, apart. And so um, so there's a way in which that function of the letters is really interesting and 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 fun. Um, but that once you get to those uh, to the letters in the book, um, you know, one of the 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 arguments that we're you know trying to to present um, to readers is that this is a space where they're both working out um, working out of poetics and that they 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 don't um, you know I don't don't presume that uh, that we can reduce their poetics to to something singular between them or to something that is um, you know 
uh, they both have just such irreducibly complex practices, but, um, but there's a way in which uh, those letters in particular for two poets who are, are have not published um, volumes where they're trying to kind of explain their, their poetics, that there is a, a working out together um, and a working out between, um, between the I and the U. And, and also a sense in which, um, you know, they're, they're working as sort of ideal readers for each other's works, you know, perhaps most, maybe most in that period, but, but I think across their works. And, and thinking about it that way, thinking about that particularity of, of audience, I think is, is maybe an interesting way of entering into the question of poetics for two poets who, who haven't um, shared their, you know, have done that, uh, that sense of presentation of their, their poetics. Sorry, Stephanie. <laughs> No, I mean, I th I think you know, I think that's absolutely right. I love I I love Kristen's phrase about that how they're ideal readers for each other's works because honestly, um, Yasmin, when you asked that question, I sort of thought, oh right, their style is very different, and it kind of took me a minute to catch up because we're so when when their um their speed and the, the rapidity at which their thought is moving together in the letters um makes it easy to forget that their that their creative work is drastically different in a lot of ways and i i think that one of the places um it's really interesting to examine this in the letters is when they react to each other's work um which they do quite frequently and, and kristen found some really lovely examples of this as well um in little magazines, but um, the one that comes to mind is cool. The difference of Coolidge's reaction to the desires of mothers to please others in letters, which is a book he loves, um, versus his reaction to Utopia, which he he never comes out and says, you know, I didn't like Utopia, but they're they're written in proximity, and he avoids talking about Utopia quite as much. And I I always got the impression reading the letters that he's a little bit but you know befuddled by that book or there's something about that book he, he isn't exactly gelling with as a reader um and so I think that that it slips in there but it's um you know you kind of have to read attentively to see how they're reacting to each other's work um and then you know the other thing I would add is is that stylistically um they're both really becoming invested in epistolarity um in these years and and in thinking about epistolarity through their own particular projects and lenses and we very much think of that as coming out of this friendship um and as you know deserving more thought um there's something about that epistolarity that i think is is really fascinating and i wondered so kind of two things um, is, would you say that their correspondence could, could perhaps almost be thought of as a genre in its own right? I'm interested in the way in which like maybe it illuminates or helps us to enrich our reading of their already published work. Um, or is it, does it feel like something that's more kind of um, a form or a genre particular to them? Do you want to start with, I mean, I can I can start and then Kristen can add. Um, I think that is part of where I'm thinking about it has moved toward. We've we don't come out and say in the introduction that this is a different genre. We're mostly interested in thinking of the letters as writing and a, yeah, a kind okay. of collaborative form of writing that is um, that is different from but on par with other you know with um, their published creative works, but. Um, thinking about it as a genre, and especially we kind of query like who who is being written to when you're writing a letter to someone. It's very intimate, but also it's very reader readerly and um, full of references that will delight other people. And Coolidge, early on in his support of this project, said, "Yes, like publish the." You know, he went back and he was rereading them and saying, "These are great." Um, so the sense that there is also that there's a wider audience um, and that they support this idea too. But um, this this was something that Kristen was really instrumental with thinking about in the introduction was how how writing is framed in these letters. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and I think I, to just swing that back to Stephanie, that Stephanie, you know, got me thinking about the way that writing and, you know, thinking about writing and talk in relation to each mm. other in, in different ways, maybe than, than I, you know, you learned maybe academically to think about it, but this sense of of trying to take a conversation that was happening in various modes while they were living close to each other, um, then you know translating into the letters and something that's trying to be up to the minute. Um, that's something that comes up uh, a couple of times in the letters explicitly, but I think implicitly is there uh, all the way through, which is trying to be up to the minute. In, in the communication as if you were talking to someone, but then recognizing that it's it's really writing. Uh, and that was something that, that Stephanie and I talked about, I think a lot in, in the work, and then was also mirrored in our own, um, you know, ways of working on the book where we had occasional Zoom meetings, but we were working on, um, you know, working in a Google doc and doing a lot of this, you know, work as writing together and yeah. meditating together. Yeah, yeah. Mayo, I mean, I'm familiar with her letters to oh, oh, the with her correspondence with Bill Berkson. Um, uh, What's your idea of a good time, which I thought was really I found really fascinating in relation to her own writing. It found it really kind of gave me a sense of her, um, whereas Bill Berkson in that book comes across as like quite square <laughs> compared with her, um, which I found kind of amazing. Um, and I also recently read this amazing like poem letter collaboration that she did with Leanne Brown um, during the pandemic, which is really gorgeous. And I hope they'll be able to do something with. Um, and then she's just published a, uh, a book of letters has come out between Bernadette and her sister, um, Rosemary. Um, and I just wondered like, what is it? Is it, is there, is, is, first of all, is, is Coolidge kind of writing to lots of other people as well? Um, and I don't know if, if, is there something about Maya as a correspondent? She seems to be a kind of a really brilliant correspondent and um, her letters seem to be coming out in all kinds of interesting ways and places. And I just, yeah, what is it about Maya's correspondence, do you think? She'd be so fun. I don't know. She'd just be so much fun to write to. I think, yeah, I yeah. To write her. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they they both had these these had ongoing correspondences. Um, and maybe Stephanie can help me speak more to this. You know, I know for Clark, one correspondence I th I think is maybe not as well known as how massive his correspondence is with Michael Palmer. Um, and extends, you know, right. across this whole period with with Bernadette as well. Um, and I, I think that, you know, that might have been an, even an expectation that that correspondence would be published before um, his correspondence with with Bernadette. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, you know, go, going back to what you said about uh, what's your idea of a good time that I think it's really interesting, you know, how so many of, of Bernadette's projects are set up as um, you know, as an experiment and the way that that's set up mm. as a, an experiment in interviewing and, and, and epistolarity. Uh, and, and maybe that's what makes the Mayor Coolidge correspondence so interesting is that for someone who was, was very intentional about setting up these projects, you know, setting up, studying hunger, setting up memory, that, that the letters have this, um, this naturalness uh, in the sense that they, you know, it's, it's just, it's it's obviously so deeply connected to her interest in epistolarity, but it's also um, something that's sort of a life force, I think, for her writing to and a the space of experiment in this, um, you know, something that doesn't have uh, an orienting framework, something that's kind of searching for its orienting frame. Mm. If you were to, you know, call it a, a project, <laughs> even though I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fascinating. <laughs> Yeah, they're, I mean, they're playful, right? Um, yeah. And, and that that's part of the, um, I think that's part of the appeal of her as a correspondent is that they're like, I remember writing her this long letter from Japan in like 2014 and inserting all these weird little gad, like little ephemera I was finding. And someone, and she said to someone after she received this correspondence, like, why is Stephanie sending me this stuff? <laughs> but I, but I, think, I think I was, attracted to this like this 
playful idea of this correspondence is capturing all these different modes of capturing all these different aspects of the everyday. Um, and this goes back to, to the question um, that we were talking about earlier about how did we narrow down the time period of the book? Um, I, you know, I've been thinking about how much of this book seems to me to be built out of paragraphs that one of the things we didn't want to do is we didn't want to cut sentences out of paragraphs because mm -hmm. Paragraphs mm -hmm. seemed like a, a kind of vessel for all of this different kind of material. Um, but once we decided we didn't want to cut sentences and, and our option, if we were going to ex excerpt letters or parts of letters was to take paragraphs, then it became very hard because you know, everything is cross fertilized, like there'll be a mention of something and then it will keep occurring through paragraphs. And it's it can be hard to make sense of the references if you're trying to excerpt just paragraphs. And, mm -hmm. and that was a big part of um, of Kristen's breakthrough idea to just kind of keep all in one time period and um, and to keep all of the letters together. Um. Yeah, that sounds like a prose poem. I mean, back to Rona's question about, is this not a form in and of itself? Like, you know, if we start thinking about New York school correspondences as their own genre, as their like version of the collaborative poem or, you know, a form, I think it comes sort of fr fruitful in Kristen's word orienting framework, you know, both as for us as readers of like how we approach this material, um, but also for the poets as, collaborative writers that this is a this is a way in which that collaboration takes a a, a um like a meaningful intentional shape back to what you were saying Kristen about um the letter being a kind of talking in tranquility to borrow Berrigan's phrase right I'm just kind of thinking out loud here but it's it's occurring to me that we as scholars might benefit from treating New York school correspondence as a form in and of itself. Yeah. I guess the question part of that is, um, you know, how that form, especially for Mayer and Coolidge as they're away, physically away, of course they never leave the kind of mindscape of the scene, but um, as, they're, as they're in different locations, if the letter writing anchors them or continues to anchor them in that sense of coterie, um, because I think your book is going to be so exciting for so many scholars out there to read who are interested in the coterie of the New York school. Um, so if that if that has come up to you, uh, you know, I have yet to get to read the book. So I'm, I'm very excited to kind of try to start answering my questions myself. But um, if, if you feel like they feel or they express a sense of staying with the coterie of the New York school through writing to each other specifically. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, maybe, yeah. well, oh, I was just saying, maybe while I think about that a little bit, or uh, I was, with the, what your question made me think of is something that, that Stephanie proposed that I, it was just such a great idea and it, it I think it works so well in the book which is that you know we have an introduction for the book and it has footnotes and and you know uh, some kind of scholarly apparatus but um, when we were talking about you know the, the fact that these letters are so filled with people and um, and friendship and coterie and, and all of this that that you know we weren't sure you know we were talking about how we were going to handle the scholarly apparatus of the letters themselves and we ended up um you know at you know stephanie had suggested this like let's preserve the mystery of of the relationships by not footnoting all of them and so i, I do think that that is something that it is maybe worth noting that that was a conscious decision on our part um, to take a lighter touch on that part of the the correspondence so that um you know, I think that's some of the fun of reading it, especially as someone who's really invested in in New York school poetry is that you'll catch the references and sort of see how it's all shaped. But I think that it would have done a disservice to the letters if we had been pinning down those connections um, in footnotes, uh, not only just because, um, not only just the preserving the mystery aspect of it, but just because they're the 
the ways that people are relating to each other in the letters are so fluid that that I think that it that allowing that to to kind of remain as part of the letters is really an important um, important for the the reader. Yeah, and to to try to speak kind of briefly to the the, the practical anchoring and coterie, the the letters as as working with or against anchoring and coterie. Um, I, I do think that this is something that that kind of changes from moment to moment. Uh, that at some points, um, the letters reflect uh, more optimism and community um, and the possibilities of coterie. Um, and at other points, they're very frustrated, and um, you know they they are. They're interested in in preserving coterie to the great degree that they're you know they are gossipy as as we've mentioned they they are you know sharing information they're excited to share information, um, but the the kind of artistic sense of of working together independently independently together um, also permeates the social sphere somewhat too. Um, at least this is my reading of it. I'm not sure, Kristen, if you agree, but uh, that 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 aspect socially comes through it at different moments, especially after Mayer goes back to New York and is head of the poetry project and is kind of having um, the experience of trying to navigate the scene there after a long time away. Um, so. I, I, I like that. I mean, one of the things that also came through in the in the practical um, components of editing was looking at the index. Um, and after the index was the index was done um, by a professional indexer, and after it was done, we realized how arbitrary indexes are to some degree. Like you think that the mentions of everyone are going to be in the index, um, but that they professional indexers think about it in terms of a certain number of entries per page potentially. And um, and so the indexes, I think Mayer would actually have loved this because she loved indexes, but the index is this, you know, this imperfect vehicle for getting a little bit of a sneak peek into, you know, some of the, the people and the coterie um, dimensions, but, but it's also, you know, you're not going to find it's not going to be a perfect map through the book, which seemed delightful. Yeah. Really, this is, I mean, it's fascinating for um, me and Yasmin to hear because we're in the process of putting together this book of interviews um, with 27 odd uh, New York school connected poets. And we're sort of starting to think about these questions, like to what extent do we kind of map in a really granular way, the friendships that are coming up, you know, or, or I mean, there are references to people that, you know, people in the know would know. So if someone says, oh, Ted did this, you know, there's a sense in which everyone knows who Ted is, but do they? Um, and, and similarly, we're thinking about the, you know, possible um, index and how that might take shape and um, questions of, you know, bibliographies and, and so on, and the extent of the kind of information that gets provided or forgotten um, in this context. I'm really interested in that idea of the fluid um, relationship, but also the sense of the imperfect vehicle, um, which I think a, a letter or a set of letters kind of are as well. You know, they, they're at once, as you, as you guys were saying earlier, they seem to be kind of simultaneously really private, but also written in the sense or the awareness that they might also become something that other people would read. Um, and, and I feel like an interview is a, is a slightly different vehicle, but there are that, you know, there are people mentioning each other and saying, oh, you know, he did this or they did that. And um, yeah, what do we kind of do with all of this information that we're coming to? Um, it's that, that's really a lot of which is rooted in gossip, um, but also the social. Um, and I think what what's interesting about perhaps what this book might do is just help us to think about that. Kind of loose and ambivalent association between people um, rather than the idea of like a school or a movement um, mm -hmm. but lots of these relationships are interpersonal and they're to do with friendship 
and falling out and not getting along and overhearing someone saying something and, and the ways in which that kind of gets tracked in correspondence and interviews is something that I find endlessly fascinating, um, particularly for someone like Bernadette Mayer, who I find her, her writing can be quite inscrutable, um, but then she comes across as this incredibly funny person in her letters and also in the interview um, that she did with Yasmin, like her, her, her cackle um, punctuates that. I don't think in any of the interviews that I've edited, I've written laughs in brackets <laughs> so many times. Yeah, exactly. um, yeah, so those, I mean, that's not really a question. Those are just some kind of thoughts in, in response to what you were saying um, about that idea of the, the fluid relationship and the social and the kind of imperfections. Yeah, you know, that's really fascinating, thinking about the relationship between the interview and the letter. Um, just because it, you know, it does come up in the letters, or at least seems to be there, you know, that sense that that there could be a wider audience for them, but certainly mm -hmm. it isn't um, in in the immediate you yeah. know, the interview. There's the sense that it would be shared, you know, perhaps immediately, but with the letter, it's almost like what you'd say, or how you would yeah. communicate. If you think, you know, maybe 50 years from now, someone will read this in the archive or something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like at what point do you start thinking that as a right, writer? Right. How does that affect what, what kind of gossip you'll share? <laughs> I, mean, I feel like Rona, I feel like you and I have started to encounter poets who are aware yeah. of the inboxes archive, right? And like we're getting little hints of it by the formality of at which they write or their, you know, date stamps on letters and that sort of thing, like the shift in kind of loose email writing, even that almost function as a chat to like very formal, you know, retro style, like this is the date of this and this is what I'm saying. And just to repeat its response to what you're saying. Um, yeah. I wonder, um, Rona, the second part of what you asked or the first part actually, goes back to what Stephanie was saying in the very beginning of, or pointing to with her quotation, the excerpt she shared with us um, of, you know, the relationship between individual um, mm. others and grouping and this sense that emerges in your course, in your work that you've done of, um, of these kinds of, well, in the work that we've all done actually, of these sorts of clusters and the fingerprints that clusters can leave rather than people. Uh, on on a moment or or a place or time then you know the poetry project in, in Mayer's moment for example um and I guess I guess that post dates the correspondence that you print that you printed um but I wonder if you know um if you might speak to that from what you found in the letters that aren't included in this collection This, there's this wonderful moment when when Mayer talks about feeling sympathy with Dr. Williams, and she means the doctor part of that. She means the yeah. like the group relation, you know, the yeah. caring aspect of the effective relations in the group um, that that springs to mind. But the the other thing I was thinking about, um, and maybe maybe Kristen wants to speak more to the to the clusters rather than individual people. Um, aspect of this because I was pushing back a little bit that so much of the letters at least to me at this moment in my life um, seem also about carving out the space and time to think and to, mm -hmm. to do your work and to be in relation maybe with an addressee who you're very simpatico with who's almost an extension of your mind they're you know they're so simpatico and um and so, but, you know, but I think that's, that's part of what I'm reading them for right now. And I think you could read, you know, read this body of work for a whole number of, of phenomena like that. Um, what do you think, Kristen? See, I'm, I'm going to double down and stay with you. Because <laughs> I, I agree. I think that was one of the things that really drew us um, to the letters and why I think it would be hard for me to, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, during, especially that period for, for Mayor um, with young children, um, with so much, you know, her, it seems like her 
letter writing practice explodes during that period, even though she's, you know, clearly has so much um, going on, but it's, you know, translating dailiness and, and these kinds of, um, you know, the natural constraints of family into uh, this writing practice that, um, that can be sort of an extension of it. Uh, and then inflects her poetry and and mm -hmm. so forth. And I know I'm sort of off the question, but I do think that I'm, I, I also think that, you know, that sense of being able to communicate with someone who you feel um, this really intense aesthetic rapport with, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. No, I think you're quite on the impossible question because it's like, it's like, especially, you know, I'm, I have, I have children in my background right now that I keep trying to mute out for you. Um, and I can see, as you say that, this being the intense, I'm just always in awe of Mayer's writing. How, how did she, how did she do this? You know, and the way you're framing it is she had to do it. It's like a sort of staying connected to yourself through, or, you know, writing to yourself and writing to the letters, making sure that you stay anchored to this kind of, um, aesthetic movement that you identify so strongly with or you know a relationship that that informs your aesthetics it, it seems like it's almost like essential it's not like you yeah. know auxiliary um oh that's a great way to put it I wasn't that, that yes that the sense of it being sort of nourishing and being like sort of an external power source um during a period when you know of you know some isolation and also you know trying to to stay connected Mm. It's a kind of intense practice. Mm. Yeah. Maybe the maybe the model of that artistic cluster too, like can offset somewhat the ghostly domestic cluster that is with you all the time, or like allow you to interact with it differently, or I don't, provide a point of contrast, or provide an extension. Or I feel like there's a relationship there, right? Um, and that was certainly, I mean, I think for both of us, maybe the maybe the most intense part of working on this project together was writing the introduction together and figuring out how we would write together. But um, but one of the really wonderful aspects of the project and the one that I always think of when I think about doing this project with Kristen is, um, is being, being um, in the research process and transcribing the letters late at night while our children, while our small children were sleeping, um, and thinking about the ways in which we could be in relation to each other and the writers in this almost, again, to use the word ghostly, but almost as transparent way as transcribers and how transcription felt like a way of being connected, like a light way of being connected um, where you kind of got to do work, you kind of got to have communication, but you also could do it while you were exhausted and, you know, um, and I, I don't know, I just always think about that, that aspect of this project that I think for both of us was very domestic and mirrored aspects of Mayor and Coolidge's family lives too. Mm. Absolutely. And, and that reminds me of um, things that um, Mayor, I think, said, uh, Maureen Owen, Hetty Jones said about um, putting together little magazines and, and type the, the action of typing up other people's poems and kind of feeling connected whilst also remaining in a sort of different psychological or emotional space but kind of feeling the language embossed I think one of them uses the word embossed on their brains and kind of feeling like you could almost recite the letters or the poems that you spent so much time kind of typing up um, in this inter really interesting sort of way. Um, and Anne Vickery writes, I think it's in the, one of the blurbs on the back of your book, um, that the, the letters will give readers a real sense of poetry as lived experience, which I thought was really a, a lovely way of thinking about correspondence in relation to the poetry as, as something that kind of comes about through, um, as you said, Stephanie, you know, carving out time to think um, and the, the journey that kind of language goes on through correspondence. Um, into the what we think of as more creative or in Mayer's case experimental or Coolidge's as well I guess um, yeah so it's really fascinating to hear again to just kind of circle back to where we started that um, although the project kind of began in um, you know with late nights and glasses of wine and and so on that there's, there's this kind of other story that it then emerges into across 
um, however many years it's, it's taken to put all of this work um, together. Um, so like, congratulations on this book. Thank it's, you. It's super Such exciting. an exciting project. We're yeah. So <laughs> yeah, really, really looking forward to reading it and, and also thinking about it as um, a kind of a really great contribution to New York School Correspondence, um, but also the way in which um, this kind of text serves as a model for other um, possible work. And also a way of letting Bernadette's voice kind of like ring out a little yeah. more after passing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's really exciting. Just everything Rona said times two. <laughs> yeah, it's um, so it's out at the end of the month, um, 30th of December, I think. Um, and it's University of New Mexico Press. Um, and I think we were saying um, before we press record that the cover is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and so it looks like a, a lovely thing to have on the shelf as well as um, a really special thing to read. Um, so all this thinking, uh, the correspondence of Bernadette Mayer and Clark Coolidge, um, Stephanie Anderson and Kristen Tapson. Congratulations and thank you so much um, for doing thank this. Um, thank you so us. much for having us. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank, thank you. you.